Hi, everybody. So we are, uh, I think, at the chapter, um, second half of chapter 12, and we're going to talk about um, a big theorem, which will probably be uh, the last big theorem that we prove, at least in this version of the course, uh, called the inverse function theorem. And um, it's about inverse functions. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. Um, but we need to start with a few preliminaries before we can before we can dive into that that whole business. So um, first of all, I want to define a very important and um, fundamental function, which is a function which is defined. If you have any set, there's always a function called the identity function, which maps um, the set A to itself, and it's the identity function because it takes each element x of A to itself, to x. So that this has lots of um, kind of avatars. It appears in lots of different ways. Um, you can think of it as a set of ordered pairs. So by definition, the identity function is the set of ordered pairs of the form a, a, where a is in the set a. And this is clearly a function because for every point in the domain, there's a unique point in the codomain that corresponds to it. And of course, if you were going to sort of draw a picture of it, this is an impression. So let's say this is A and this is A. Then the identity function is the diagonal. It's all the points where the X and Y coordinates are the same. So if you're interested in the identity function for the set R, this is the function f of x equals x, whose graph in the coordinate plane is just the diagonal line. So um, maybe the one thing that confuses people about the identity function is they, um, they get confused with the fact that, that 1 or 0 is an additive or a multiplicative or an additive identity. And they think that the identity function is the function whose value is the constant 1 or the constant 0. But it's not a constant function. It's the function whose value at x is x itself. So maybe that's the one thing um, to, uh, to keep straight about the identity function. Maybe I'll also say it certainly depends on the set A. On the, set a. the identity function for the integers and the identity function for the real numbers are different um, because one is a function from the integers to the integers and one is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. So the identity function is bijective. Um, maybe we'll just check this as a little practice with bijectivity. So there are two parts to the proof. We have to show that the identity function is injective. And that means that we have to show that if A and A prime are in A and the identity function of A at a equals the identity function at a of a prime, then a equals a prime. This is what we have to show. But since the identity function at a of a equals a, and the identity function at a of a prime equals a prime, clearly a equals a prime. So it's injective. And then we have to check that it's surjective. In other words, we have to show that for any a in a, there is an a prime in a so that i a of a prime is a. And if we set a prime equal to a, then i a of a prime is i a of a is a. So the identity function is a very simple example of a bijective function. And it just takes 
each element of the set and maps it to itself. I guess if you wanted to draw the picture using circles or an arrows, it would look like this. Not very artistic, but that's the idea. Okay, now as I mentioned, our goal is to prove the inverse function theorem, but we're going to start with a, a more general idea, um, which is the inverse of a relation. And again, this is a different use of the word inverse as opposed to 1 over x. It has nothing to do with multiplicative inverses or additive inverses, so, I mean, except in the sense that it undoes an operation. So um, don't, don't mess, mess, mess those things up in your head. So the, uh, the definition of an inverse relation is very simple. Suppose you have a relation between two sets A and B. So you have a collection of ordered pairs sitting inside the Cartesian product of A with B. Then the inverse relation is just what you get if you reverse everything. It's the collection of pairs B comma A, where the B is in B and A is in A, and, and the you just take the original pairs in R and you switch the A and the B. So um, if you are thinking about this in terms of, uh, of, of sort of a picture of the Cartesian product, here's A and here's B. And R, remember, is just a collection of points in the Cartesian product. So these are the points of R. Then R inverse is a relation on B and A, and the points correspond to flipping the, um, the X and Y coordinates of the points. So if this point here, let's say, is like at 1, 4, then let me call this point here 1. It's going to be over here. After, in, in, I mean, it, so it's the, it's the same set of points in a certain sense, but with their coordinates reversed. And this one over here, which is at kind of minus 1, minus 1, or minus 2, minus 2, is going to stay over there. And... Um, Oh, sorry, that's wrong. It's not at minus 2, minus 2. It's at minus 2, plus 2. So it's going to go to, if it's at minus 2, plus 2, it's going to go to plus 2, minus 2. So it's going to be down here. So um, one way to think about what's going on here is that you're reflecting the points about the diagonal line y equals x. So any point on the line y equals x stays where it is, because when you switch the coordinates, they don't change. And points over here get reflected down to the other side. So you may have seen this uh, in, in one of your other classes where you talked about graphs of inverse functions and so forth. Here we're not talking about functions, just relations, but um, the inverse relation, the set of points is gotten by, by flipping to the other side of the line y equals x, which of course is the graph of the identity function. So let's look at a couple of examples. So suppose r is the less than relation. What happens when you take the inverse relation? Well, the inverse relation is the collection of pairs B A, where A is less than B, and A B are in the real numbers. And that looks a little bit funny, but we can write that a little, we can write that differently. It's the collection of pairs. If I if I call A B and B A, then instead of A being less than B, A is the first coordinate the first coordinate is, is bigger than the second coordinate. So the inverse relation to less than is the relation greater than. And um, if you want to see kind of a picture of that, so let's draw a picture of the relation less than on R cross R. So the points in the relation less than are all the points where X is less than Y. So if I draw X equals Y, that's here then x is less than y uh, are all the points down, I guess, 
all these points up here. Uh, so for instance, this point here is the point 0, 2, and x is less than y. Points over here have x is bigger than y. And what happens when we, um, when we look at the inverse relation? Well, we still have this line y equals x. And now we get this is, here's r, the relation r, which is less than. And here's r inverse, which is greater than. And now um, the set of points that we're interested in are all the points over here, where x is bigger than y. So again, you see this phenomenon where switching by taking the inverse of relation flips the set of points over the line y equals x. Here's another example, which is a little trickier to draw. So we have the divides relation. Uh, A divides B if, the, so this is a relation on Z. If there exists C in Z, so that B equals AC. So this is a collection of, set of, this is R. So we have a collection of points inside Z cross Z, um, corresponding to the situation where the X coordinate is a divisor of the Y coordinate. Um, so the inverse relation, R inverse, well, it's now the set of pairs BA, where A divides B. We just flipped the relation around. And to interpret this, the idea is that now um, we're going to, so the confusing thing is now we've changed the letters, but if we, if we re, re, relabel BA and AB, this is the collection of pairs AB, but instead of A dividing B, it's, um, so A here is the second element, B dividing A. So the relation here is that ARB mean a r inverse b means that not that a is a divisor of b but a is a multiple of b in other words that b divides a so taking the inverse of the divide relation changes things instead of having the relation a is a divisor of b it becomes the relation a is a multiple of b um <clears throat> we could draw the picture here. Uh, maybe we can take a stab at it. Let's just draw draw the positive ones. It's a little weird. Um, so we have, um, so first of all, one is a divide. This is the relation A divides B. So one divides everything. Here's one. So one divides one, one divides two, one divides three, one divides four, and so forth. Here's two. 2 doesn't divide 1, but it does divide 2, and it doesn't divide 3, but it does divide 4, and so on. Here's 3. 3 doesn't divide 1 or 2, but it does divide 3, 4, 5, and so on. And um, to draw the multiple picture, we would have to make a similar diagram. Here's 1. 2 is a multiple of 1. Uh, sorry, here, here's one. Two is a, one is a multiple of one, two is a multiple of one, three is a multiple of one, four is a multiple of one. Here we have two, two, one is not a multiple of two, but two is a multiple and so on. And so you see these, this pattern of black dots here becomes this row of, column of black dots becomes this row of black dots here. This column of alternating dots becomes this row and so on. So um, the multiple relation is the inverse to the divides relation. So um, there's a couple of examples. The next topic that we're going to look at is um, what happens 
when instead of just looking at relations, you look at functions and you apply this inverse operation.